mind to get started this evening. Let's take our psalm books to page number 95. Page number 95 tonight. Page number 95 in your psalm books this evening. Page number 95. No one cared for me like Jesus. Page number 95. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Love lifted me. Page number 138. Page number 138. I was sleeping deep in sin, dark with a peaceful soul. tonight and we'll have a word of prayer and have a time of welcoming folks to church this evening, all right? 
All right. Brother Abe, would you lead us in prayer tonight, please? Lord, we thank you for this good day. We thank you for all the work that we got done. We pray for the people who get here in church, Lord, and help out the safe trip for all Lord. And pray for the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Turn around and welcome folks to church tonight. first verse of that. come preach and then uh, 7 30 we'll have prayer meetings so get in your mind things that need to be prayed about and get our hearts in condition so we can pray brother josh matthew chapter 6 please matthew chapter 6 greatest sermon ever preached Verse 19 and 20. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the value, the worth of your word. It's infinite value that we have something here worth more than all the gold in all the world, Father. And Lord, we don't need what this world has because we have your word and we have heaven to look forward to and eternity with you. And we thank you for this, Father. Make this real to us tonight. Make it real to my heart, my family's heart, Lord, and each one of us here. In Jesus' name, give us sight of eternity, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Matthew 6 here, Jesus speaking, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. I want to look at the subject of moth eaten tonight. Moth eaten, that would be the title, moth eaten. And you think about a moth and what it does whenever a moth eats something. A moth is a frail creature. We'll look at that. We're going to look at the moth through the Bible. There's not a whole lot of references, but there are more than you might think. And a moth is a frail little creature, and it does tiny little bits of damage, but it completely ruins what it touches. It's, and when, it, when a moth comes and ruins something, the value of it appears to still be there until you put that shirt on and there's a hole right there. And it's just a little bitty hole. And it doesn't care if you bought that shirt at Dillard's for $150. It doesn't care where you got it or how much you spent on it. That little moth eats one little hole and moves to your next piece of clothing and eats one little hole and moves to the next piece. Jesus says here, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. There's three areas that God uses the moth to show us weakness in. And the first area is the weakness of this world and its entire economic system. It's moth-eaten. He says the moth eats it, rust corrupts it. He says, thieves break through and steal. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are not ye, are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. We could go on through all of chapter 7. We'll just look at a couple verses in chapter 7. Verse 7, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We begin in verse 22, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not... Ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. All these things do the nations of the world seek after. All these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. 
but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not, little flock, for it, fear not, fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not where no thief approacheth. Neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. What if Christ came back this week? What if he came back this year? What would all of our financial planning matter if he came back this year? And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. This is the weakness of the world. The world's weakness is in its temporal nature. The world's weakness is in the fact that the moth and the rust destroys everything. If you ever want a reality check, drive through the, um, drive through the back roads of Texas sometime. You just drive and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive. But as you're driving, you'll see a little house off to the side and its roof is falling in and the fence is all overgrown. But it, you might think that place is a wreck, but somebody a hundred years ago cared for that place. A hundred years ago, somebody mowed the lawn and took care of the fence and possibly van. And somebody probably took care of it and painted it and put a new roof on it. And there it is falling in a hundred years later. And all of our houses that we have today in a hundred years will have fallen in. Our vehicles that we work so hard to keep going on the road. Right, Brother Joe? Where it always seems like there's something you got to fix. They're all going to go away someday. The weakness of the world is its corruption. The weakness of the world is its temporal nature. It will not last. It's like building castles in the sand. You can build a beautiful sand castle, but the tide is going to come in. And our life is like that. You can build a beautiful castle of temporal things in this life, but someday the tide's going to come in. And when it goes back, there might be a little lump left where your life once stood. And then when the tide comes in again, there'll just be the faintest little hump. And by the third generation or the fourth generation, your own offspring will barely remember your name. You'll just be in a genealogy somewhere. And it won't really mean anything to anybody. They won't even have an emotional attachment to your name other than the fact that that was who I came from. Because they won't remember your face. They won't remember anything about you. This life is a vapor. And the weakness of the world is its temporalness. The weakness of the world is its corrupt corruptibility. But there's another weakness that I want to look at tonight with the Lord's help. The Lord switched this on me. Um, and I'm trying to mind the Lord. We'll go next to the weakness of man. Weakness of man. And for that, let's go to Job chapter 4. So we see the weakness of the world. And we see the weakness of world economics. We see the weakness of currency that rusts. We see the weakness of garments and houses and lands. But now let's look at the weakness of man. In Job chapter 4 and verse 19, the Bible says, How much less in, in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed, before the moth. Now this is Eliphaz speaking and Eliphaz really was, he missed it. Anytime you read Job, be careful getting doctrine out of it. You got to know who's talking and what they're talking about and get it in context. But here Eliphaz, the, what he's driving at, he's using the moth as an example saying that man is weaker than a moth. Man is crushed before the moth. Have you ever crushed a moth? It doesn't take much to crush a moth. You can have a great big moth and you take it in your hands and you can try to be gentle and let it go. And there it goes. It can't fly. It's fluttering along and the dust is on your hands and you try and help it and you kill it even more. A kid that wants to help a moth kills it. Sure as anything. If you want to help a moth, I don't know why you would. The best thing you can do is leave it alone and maybe give it access to your closet. 
where it can eat your clothes. But a moth is crushable. They're so weak. I don't know of a living creature that is weaker than a moth. I really don't to think about it. And I've Maybe there is one out there, but I don't really know about it for its size, for the size of that creature, the weakness of it. It takes only the slightest handling to destroy a moth. And here Eliphaz says that man is crushed before the moth. Go to chapter 13. <coughs> Try not cough in the mic. Excuse me. Job chapter 13 <coughs> and verse 28. Here, Job, starting back in verse 20. Five says, wilt thou break, wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro and wilt thou pursue the dry stubble thinking of a brown leaf in the fall that's blowing in the wind across the yard? He says, wilt thou break a leaf? He's speaking of his own self, telling his friends, why are you trying to break me? I'm as weak as a leaf. He goes on, he says, for thou writest bitter things against me and makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. And right there is why man is weak. The iniquities of man. Sin is what makes man weak. Sin is what has brought man low. And we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that weakness is in us. My comeliness is turned into corruption, one man said. Thou puttest my feet also in the stalks and lookest narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet. And he, as a rotten thing, consumeth as a garment that is moth-eaten. So here he's making a comparison of himself, if I understand it right, to a garment that is moth-eaten. That though he looks like he's alive, yet he's ruined in his very self. And though he looks like he still has the ability to argue with his friends, he's saying, inside, I'm weak, I'm broken, I'm corrupted inside. And why are you attacking me? I'm so weak, I'm so broken. Chapter 20. 27 and verse 18. And this is man, and this is all of us as men. The strongest man that ever lived, as he's standing there, you can think about maybe General Patton in World War II. Inside, he was still a weak, corrupt man on the inside, with no power inside to save himself or his friends. Um, chapter 27, we've got to keep moving. Verse 18. Here, he buildeth his house as a moth and as a booth that the keeper maketh. Without taking a bunch of time to look at the context, this is talking about a temporary shelter. Speaking about these, look at verse 16. Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepare raiment as the clay, he may prepare it, but the just shall put it on and the innocent shall divide the silver. He buildeth his house as a moth and as a booth that the keeper maketh. So this is the rich man who sins against God that Job is speaking about. And he says his mansion that, Brother Phil, we get paid to work on, right? His mansion that... A lot of us can't afford to even think about owning. His mansion is like a moth. His mansion is really just weakness. The only thing that makes it look like it's anything is just our own weakness. Because in reality, if we lived even 150 years, that mansion would not exist without major work. So his mansion is as a moth. This is the weakness of man. We have the weakness of the world and its economic system. We have the weakness of man in his own systems and his ability to take care of himself and his, his inner man and the weakness of his insides. But I want you to get this tonight. And this is the drive of the message. This is where we're trying to get. And we want to see the weakness of our enemies. Because those of us who serve God have many enemies that would destroy us. Isaiah 50 verse 9. Isaiah 50, Isaiah 50, here God is encouraging the prophet Isaiah, and it will start in verse 5 here, the Lord God hath opened mine ear, this is typology of Christ, if you look at the context, he says, the Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back, Tobias, when God sends you out to preach on the, at the doors, he's opened your ear and sent you, he's, and the, here Isaiah is saying, I was not rebellious, neither turned away back, he's still going, that's the idea, that's what he's saying, I'm still going, but he's not going because he's strong, he's going in his weakness. He's going in his corruption. He's going with all the difficulties of the weakness of the world and the weakness of the world's economic system. And everything's against him. Not only is all this against him, but he has enemies. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Look at verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know 
that I shall not be ashamed. His hope is not in the world. His hope is not in himself. His hope is in the Lord that he will not be ashamed. So he goes on anyway. He goes on in spite of the world, in spite of himself, and in spite of his enemies. He sets his face like a flint. And he says, God is near. And look at verse 8. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. And I want you to know tonight that your enemies are weak. Your enemies have no power. Though they stand against you in apparent wealth, in apparent power, though they may have all the authority of a corrupt government behind them, though they may come against you with force and with power and with anger and with wrath and numbers in the thousands, yet God says, the moth shall eat them up. Set your face like a flint. Trust God. Be not rebellious. Turn not back from following after God because your enemies are like a moth. God is going to destroy them. They are weak. They are weak. They don't look weak when you're standing there and they're they're frowning right down in your face and it looks like everything's against you, but they're weak. Believe God, they're weak. 51 in verse 8 says, the moth shall eat them up like a garment. The moth shall eat them up like a garment. Speaking of these enemies, he says, hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men. Do you hear these words? Fear ye not the reproach of men. Fear ye not the reproach of men. Neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment. And the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever. And my salvation from generation to generation. He goes on there. Read it when you have time. Awake, awake. Put on strength. We'll just grab a couple verses. O arm of the Lord, awake as in the ancient days in the generation of old. Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? Are you not the God that parted the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh in the midst? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall shall flee away. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man? Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and of the Son of Man which shall be made as grass? And forgettest the Lord thy Maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and hast feared continually every day. He said, you've been afraid every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? Oppressor. God says, where is it? Where is it? You're all right. You're all right today. You were afraid yesterday. You were afraid before. But where is the thing you were afraid of? Has not God taken care of you? Has not God kept you? He says in verse 15, I am the Lord thy God that divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art my people." Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. He's talking to people who deserve punishment. These people that have drunk of the cup of God's fury, thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons. And it says, I'm trying to skip down through here and speed it up. It says down here, these two things are come upon thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction. But look at verse 21. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith the, thy Lord the Lord, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again, but I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, bow down. 
Bow down that we may go over, and thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. Those that tread you under their feet, God says, it's going to end. This is all going to end. All of this affliction, persecution, suffering, trial, attack, torment, libel, slander, everything that they do against you, it's going to end. And he's going to take you where they've said, bow down and trampled over you. He's going to raise you up and he's going to put that cup in their hand. They're as the moth. Fear not, God says. You can look at Hosea, the last reference, 5.12 later. But we're out of time. Praise the Lord.